There is uh, pumpkin pie in the back to be served <laughs> later. Thank you, Sarah, for, uh, for that intro clip. Appreciate that. And I want to thank uh, Kent and uh, the elders here for asking me to preach again. After the last time, I didn't... No, I, <laughs> no, I appreciate the opportunity to preach. I love uh, to take an opportunity to preach God's Word and do something a little different. And I, when Kent and I first started talking about this, by the way, I love coming and just listening to Kent. Kent does a great job of preaching. <laughs> I say that because he was trained at one of my colleges that I went to, so right up there with, uh, with all those guys that went to Lincoln and uh, St. Louis. Uh, we'll just include them in it as well. But I want to thank uh, your elders and thank your your congregation for uh, the warm uh, welcome and the love that you guys have shown to us. Uh, today I have something a little different. Kent and I were talking about this, and I don't want to step on any Thanksgiving toes because next week is the Thanksgiving sermon, right? So I'd like to consider the other Thanksgiving today. You, you know the first Thanksgiving. Everybody, I, I think of myself as a, a professional Thanksgiving eater. And I think some of you do also. Uh, that tryptophan kicks in and the football game is boring and you're out. And that's a good thing because there are dishes to be done and things. And if you can drink, if you can eat enough turkey to cause you to go to sleep, then you don't have to do the dishes, right? And you're all familiar with that, that uh, first Thanksgiving or the regular Thanksgiving. Let's just call it the regular Thanksgiving, where we acknowledge our blessings from God and how fortunate we are. We think about all of the things that we've received. We think about the turkey. We think about the cranberries. We think about the salt and the pumpkin pie with the Cool Whip on top of it. Yeah. We think about the cranberry relish, but there remains another Thanksgiving. Uh, from this time forth, I guess I will call it the other Thanksgiving. It is a Thanksgiving that we are called to, but I don't know that we are excited to show up for it. It's the Thanksgiving where we give thanks to God for the many adversities that we go through in life and the hardships and troubles that we face, because we all know that we uh, naturally go to God with gratitude for all the blessings that we receive, but how many times do we go before God with thanksgiving for the adversity that we go through and the hardship and the troubles that we go through. Uh, that doesn't happen in, in my life as frequently. And, and I'm not advocating that we have another Thanksgiving day where we set aside turkey and pie, although that doesn't sound like a bad idea, right? Uh, I'm not advocating for another day that we set aside. Uh, but when we look at our text this morning that I'd like to share with you, obviously we're called in many passages to render thanks to God for even the adversity and the trouble that we go through in life. So if you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. There are two Thessalonians, don't get the wrong one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. If you uh, didn't bring a Bible with you, pull one up on, on your phone. You probably brought a phone with you and find a Bible app and follow along with us this morning. I'd, I'd like to go back and, and read uh, verses uh, 16, 17, and 18, because those aren't very long verses, right? Uh, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and then this is our text for this morning. In everything, give thanks to God, for this is his will for you, in Christ Jesus, in everything, give thanks to God. This is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. You know, at, at first that doesn't set well with me, and, and it probably doesn't set well with you either, to give thanks to God for our adversities and hardships. So we're going to break that down this morning and just see uh, that it is adversity that we're called to give thanks in. Not, not just the blessings that we receive in life and the turkey and the cranberries, but also the hardships, the pumpkin pie filled with salt, 
uh, the turkey that doesn't turn out right, um, the expenses that come in around Thanksgiving, the thought about Christmas being on the way, uh, all of the anxiety and the things that cause you a little bit of dread, those are the things that we do have to give thanks to God in. Uh, I also listed another text there, and you might want to look at that. That is uh, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, that mentions this exact same scenario. Don't be anxious, Paul would say. Don't be, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, with supplication or prayer and thanksgiving, present your needs before God. It says the same thing. And I like it when the Bible can explain the Bible for me and I can understand uh, a difficult passage like this because at first, what person in their right mind would say, give thanks to God for all the troubles that you go through? That's not natural. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. It's spiritual. It's foolishness in my head, but it is wisdom from God. Uh, we do have to give thanks in all of our hardships. I don't mean by that uh, sin. We're not including that as a hardship or temptation. So sin and temptation are not hardships that you go through. Although we might say trials and temptation, sometimes there's a big difference between having a flat tire and uh, deciding to uh, cut loose on somebody and, and yell at them with uh, all kinds of, of curses. We should give thanks to God uh, in our troubles. And there's a subtle difference between in our troubles and for our troubles. And I thought, well, hurricane recently, we'll use that as an example. I'm grateful to God in the middle of the hurricane. I'm not so grateful for the hurricane. I'm grateful in the hurricane. There's a difference, and, and maybe it's a difference worth noting this morning, that we're thankful in the circumstances that we're in. We're not necessarily grateful for the circumstances. You know, might be something tragic that's happened, and, and we should be grateful to God in that circumstance, not necessarily for the circumstance. I'm grateful that the hurricane didn't go somewhere else and didn't cause as much damage as it, as it uh, or it could have caused more damage. But I'm grateful in the hurricane to God, not necessarily for the hurricane. And uh, uh, one of the reasons that we should be thankful to God is because these hardships and adversities do for us something that cranberries and turkey could never do. Uh, they do something. They work in our lives to do something different than what a life of ease and comfort could do. Difficulties, real difficulties, hardships, bad news. Those things all cause something in us that turkey couldn't do. As much as it's stuffed or, or whether it's fried uh, or, or whether it's, uh, what, what do they call it, when, when you, you brine a turkey and then you fry the, the turkey. So there are all kinds of methods to eat that turkey. But it's not going to do for you what hardship can. Uh, just a real quick example. Uh, hardship can inspire faith in a person. Hardship and difficulty can cause us to not wander away from the word of God and and do our own thing. Those trials and hardships can make us come back to the word of God. It can cause us to live a more holy life when we go through difficulties and hardships. If we go through them correctly, like we're looking at this morning, and give thanks to God for them, they can empower us to be holy and prepare us for that course toward heaven. Turkey and pie cannot do those things. Let's be grateful to God, not only for what we enjoy in life, but what we endure in this life as well for his kingdom's sake. A couple passages uh, that I want you to remember as you think about this really crazy idea of giving thanks to God in adversity that we experience. Don't forget about Romans chapter 8, verse 28, right? Romans 8, 28. Some of you were probably thinking of that already. 
Well, because God is active and busy in all of our trials and hardships and turning them into good for his purpose and for his kingdom. God takes what's broken and makes it beautiful. He's always in the business of taking what Satan breaks and turning it into beauty. So we should thank God for the hardships that we face in life. We should be thankful. Uh, another passage is in James chapter 1. If you like to turn to James chapter 1 and look at verses 2 and 3, where James says, uh, and, and this is the Lord's half-brother, where James says, to consider it a pure joy when you face all kinds of trials and hardships. <laughs> that sounds strange, doesn't it? Same idea, though, give thanks to God in adversity. Consider it a joy when you go through adversity. And James says, because this is causing endurance in you. This is doing something that you didn't know it would do. It, it brought you to your knees, right? But that's the perfect place for you to render thanks to God from. Let's give thanks to God in our adversity. God is the one who should be thanked. God, not not your lucky rabbit's foot. I always thought, you, know, you call it a lucky rabbit's foot, but it was not luck for the rabbit. So why would you, why would, I don't think anybody carries a rabbit's foot anymore. Uh, you're not going to thank your lucky stars. Uh, you're not going to be thankful that, that it wasn't worse. You're going to be thankful to God. Thankful to God even though you don't understand what's going on. And, and listen, there's a guy in the uh, Bible by the name of Job. And I didn't list uh, this because it is rather a long explanation. But uh, if, you, if you have time, go ahead and turn in the book of Job from the first chapter on to the second chapter. And I want to go over real quickly what happened in Job's life so that, so that you may know that it's okay to give thanks to God in difficulties and hardships. So this is the situation. Job is, he's sitting around. He's a, he, this is pre-flood era, probably. I don't know where Kent is on that, but probably before the flood. Uh, this is prior to the, the great deluge that, that cleansed the world, Pr prior to Noah. And uh, Job is experiencing something. Uh, here, here's his situation. Here's what happens. Um, a guy comes in and says, Job, I've got news for you. Your donkeys. 500 of the female donkeys that you have, and 1,000 of your oxen, that's uh, 500 yoked oxen, or it would be 1,000, have all been stolen by evil men. Evil men have come in. They wore masks. They carried gun. No, they didn't carry. They carried swords or sticks, and they stole all of Job's donkeys and oxen, and they murdered all of his servants. And while this guy was explaining this to Job, another guy comes in and says, wait, I've got, I've got some other news. There has been a fire come from heaven. It's an unnatural disaster. Uh, you would say, well, it's a natural disaster. But no, it's an unnatural disaster for fire to fall from heaven, and it consumes 7,000 sheep. Big fire, right? Uh, it consumes all of the sheep. 7,000 sheep are burned, and there was no mint jelly. No mint jelly. Not only did the fire consume all of Job's sheep, but it also killed all of his servants tending to the sheep. And while that guy is talking, another guy comes in, and he says, no, 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 wait, wait, I got more news. Evil men have stolen 3,000, all of your camels, 3,000 camels they've walked off with. You can't do that sneak in a, in a sneaky way, because camels are rather tall, and it probably was obvious to everybody, but more evil men have come in and they've taken all of Job's camels and they've murdered all of his servants. And while he's talking, another guy comes in. You get the idea that at this point, Job would like to lock the door. But he says that another unnatural disaster has occurred. A wind has come and it's collapsed the building upon ten of his all ten of his children and killed them. Job says, 
Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. May the name of the Lord be praised. Uh, the next day, uh, he has, uh, uh, you, you can look in the second chapter, notice that uh, Satan comes before the throne of God and requests that he might inflict harm upon Job's own body. And God, in his sovereignty, permits Satan to inflict Job in this way. That's key for our understanding of this. God permits Satan to enact evil men and unnatural disasters and also his own health. Job's own health was taken. And if you don't know anything about Job's wife, well, she was the only one that survived this whole calamity. And that may in and of itself been uh, a troublesome or hardship thing for Job to face. But his, his wife says to him, here's the idea. This is uh, Job chapter 2, verse 9, I think. Uh, here's an idea. Why don't you just curse God and die? And Job probably is thinking, why didn't you have a sister? Uh, and to that, Job, Job responds in verse 10. Uh, go ahead and look in uh, Job 2, verse 10. This is a, I, I think that this is an important passage for our developing a Christian uh, worldview that answers the problem, why is there pain and suffering in the world? This helps us to understand that. In Job chapter 2, uh, verse 10, Job says, You speak as a foolish woman speaks. I don't know how he got away with that. But he told her, Should we accept the good from God and not also the evil or the harm? Or this is the Greek word kaka, and it means the things that don't happen that are good to you, but the things that happen that you might not like, that might not be pleasant to you, things that happen that aren't pleasant. Should we accept the good from God and not the things that are not pleasant? Job said this, and, and the Bible says that in doing this, he did not sin in charging God with bringing about evil in his life or hard uh, uh, a hard life or hardship in his life because God was not behind it. The fallen world was behind it. And God was involved in it, permitting it and protecting us through it. God was in control of it. Uh, this led Job to say things like Job 13, verse 15. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. And if it means that my life is taken, I know that there is a better life to come. God is sovereign. He's reliable. Right there in the middle of our adversity. And in the middle of that adversity, he reigns supreme and in control. And he is the one that can take hardship and trouble and turn it into something good for his kingdom. Uh, John chapter 16, if you turn your Bibles to John chapter 16, uh, verse 33, Jesus has something to say about this, and he makes it clear, John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Uh, David, the psalmist, uh, in Psalm 34, verse 1, Psalm 34, verse 1, uh, this is the occasion, I don't know if you Old Testament scholars remember, when uh, uh, David was at odds with Abimelech, and I think, I think it was Abimelech, and David went before him and acted like he'd lost his mind. Do you remember that story? Well, this is after that, and David writes in Psalm 34, verse 1, I will bless the Lord, I will thank the Lord at all times even for the hardships that we face. We need to be grateful to God. I can't see if Satan is putting trials in my path, but I know this, that God is greater than any hardship I will face. And so he needs to be thanked in the middle of our adversity. Uh, lastly this morning, though, I'd like for you just to consider real quick
the reason that we do this is not because it's fun or it's easy to do. The reason that we do this is because our text says, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, that you face trouble and hardship with a grateful heart. Now, I want to correct a few things real quick because they come up all the time when we're saying things about our hardships. Uh, first of all, hardship is not my wish or my will. I, I don't go looking for trouble. I hope that you don't go looking for trouble either. But if you experience trouble, you shouldn't say, well, they were probably getting what they deserved because you probably don't feel like you get what you deserved when you experience hardship. Uh, nor should we say something foolish like, well, it could always be worse. Have you said that yourself? Well, I'm facing trouble and hardship. But it could always be worse. Is, is that some kind of challenge or something? <laughs> no. no. And in fact, when we say things like that, we min minimize what a person's going through. And, and we don't consider, we don't grasp that God is in control right in the middle of that situation. That God can turn that bad thing into something good. That God can turn that difficult time that you experience into something good for his kingdom. Nor should we respond with sarcasm. And we've done this a lot, right? Oh, gee, thanks God. That's not the thanks that he's looking for. Uh, you know, things weren't bad enough. You had to put this on me too. No, that's not the way that we should respond with gratitude toward God. In fact, should you experience trials and hardships, should you experience difficulties as you go through life, we can keep in mind that God is sovereign. He's above our situation. Paul didn't allow uh, hardship to rob him. Paul mentions in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 12, if you would like to turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Paul mentions in that passage uh, the fact that he has this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. Some people say it was his eyesight, he, that he had poor eyesight, uh, that his eyes uh, were not what they had used to be, and he had difficulty writing and things. Uh, we, don't, we just don't know what it was that was Paul's difficulty. But he says that he prayed to God uh, three times. And then he had concluded that Christ responded, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And in that passage, Paul says, therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more in my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. In fact, he goes on to say, so I take pleasure in weakness, hardship, difficulties, suffering. Uh, and he says, weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Because he relied on God through those hardships and through those difficulties. Later, Paul would say, Hey, I've learned a secret to being content in any and all circumstances. And people would go, oh, I'd like, I'd like to do that. Really? You would like to be content in the middle of hardship? Because that's what God calls us to. Paul says, I've learned to be content in those circumstances. I, I know how to do with little, and I know how to do with a lot. And in any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. And that's where the passage, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, comes from. I can do all things. I can go through that trial. I can go through this hardship. I can go through this difficulty. And I, more than that, more than just being able to endure it and go through it, I can give thanks to God right in the middle of it. Because he's sovereign and he's in control and he has my best at stake. He has my best in mind. And he will do what's best for his kingdom. And for that, 
I will be grateful. Thanksgiving. It should no longer consist of just our blessings. Uh, you, you can remember the prayer at the table with all the thank you for the mashed potatoes and the gravy and that salt is not in the pumpkin pie. But this year, let's remember that other Thanksgiving. Uh, I don't know what day you'd want to celebrate it on. I'm not calling for another Thanksgiving day, although another opportunity to eat turkey and stuff like that is great. Let's remember this other Thanksgiving. Without hardships, who would know how close you are walking with Christ Jesus? Whether your faith would be frail or even dead. Let's remember to give thanks in hardship. Without them, we might not love others as we've been called to. When adversity brings you to your knees, how quickly will you fold your hands and lift your eyes toward heaven and be grateful. Yes, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good.